This is Rock Talk with Mitch LaFawn. Mitch LaFawn. Welcome to this episode of Rock Talk with Mitch LaFawn, and I am your host, of course, Mitch LaFawn. Huh? See how that works? And you may or may not be noticing something with the audio because I am using a blue Yeti microphone. I was told, I was told that the serious, serious podcaster uses the Blue Yeti microphone. It's a must. So here we are. We're giving it a try now. I, I feel tested it a little bit, and I noticed that it picks up a lot more ambient sound, so I will sit as still as possible, and I will concentrate to not make any mistakes. But uh, anyway, our uh, guest today is, of course, the one and only guitarist Don Felder. He has a new album out called American Rock and Roll. And if you know Don, you know that that's what he delivers. Great, great American rock and roll. And in fact, what else would you expect from the man who co-wrote Hotel California? So we talked to Don about the new album and some other stuff. But uh, before that, we are, well, let me tell you, this weekend, uh, we are now in the third weekend or last weekend of May. On May 26th, uh, 2019, I got a chance to see Night Ranger on a bill with Sammy Hagar. And I have to tell you two things. Well, let me start off with Sammy. First of all, everybody in Sammy Hagar's camp was exceptionally nice and exceptionally accommodating. And for a man who's about to turn 72 years old, the performance he delivered was outstanding. I have seen some 25 and 30 year olds who stand there with an air of, look at me, uh, I'm, a, I'm a rock god and yet deliver zero performance and zero anything interesting. And Sammy was just all over the place. He was running on the stage. He was interacting with his musicians. The fact that he got to deliver those classic Van Halen songs, uh, Best of Both Worlds, uh, he did Eagles Fly, Right, speaking of Don Felder, Eagles Fly, uh, he it was just incredible. It was absolutely incredible, and and I I've mentioned it to the folks at M three that I saw saw the show, and I said, boy, you know what? If you were to book Don Felder at M three, it would be absolutely spectacular. Uh, so there's that, and of course, uh, what what would really be spectacular is a completely gratuitous plug for my uh, t-shirts the rock talk with mitch lafon t-shirts available now at loudtracks.com forward slash mitch loudtracks l-o-u-d-t-r-a-x dot com forward slash mitch m-i-t-c-h and for those of you who have purchased them uh thank you by the way for throwing them up on twitter and facebook and all those other places and tagging me but again Thank you for the support, and for those who, of you who may not be aware, the uh, merchandiser, Loud Tracks, is part of the uh, global merchandising network. They are official merch pro uh, providers for Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, so while you're at the uh, site and you want to pick up a Mitch shirt, you can actually shop in confidence that if you're buying an Iron Maiden shirt or a Judas Priest shirt or any of the merch there, that it is officially licensed, it is uh, totally ban band approved and all that. It is not, uh, you know, it's not bootleg stuff that you get outside of a venue for 10 bucks. So now back, back to Guilford, New Hampshire. I had a chance to hang out with the Night Ranger guys and exchange a lot. You know, I, we, we sat down, me and uh, Jeremy White from the Beat 92 in Montreal and had, this was unbelievable by the catering, uh, prime rib and lobster catering it at Guilford and we sat down with uh, Jack Blades, Brad Gillis and uh, Kelly Keegi to uh, to eat supper uh, at the catering and we got into all kinds of conversations what's going on with Revolution Saints with for Jack Blades uh you know Dean Castronova when he played with Night Ranger and 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 of course working with Jack on Revolution Saints and eventually we led to Brad Gillis, a uh, guitarist, who of course spent some time with Ozzy, as we all know, uh, talking about his upcoming solo album. That's right, folks. You are hearing it first. Brad Gillis of Night Ranger fame and Ozzy fame has a solo album uh, coming out, put together with Gary Moon, who sang on the Night Ranger album Feeding Off the Mojo. And uh, Brad played us the entire album. And then uh, he sent me 
the uh, tracks after, and it is absolutely uh, delightful. C- can we review albums as delight? Is that rock and roll to say delightful? I'm not overly sure, but it's a word I like. Anyway, let- let's go with terrific. It is a straightforward rock and roll album, uh, right? And-, and since we're talking of Don Felder and his album, American Rock and Roll, um, well, this new Brad Gillis album is classic American rock and roll. It is, it is, it's absolutely terrific. So there is no release date for it yet. Um, you know, Brad is going to shop it to different labels. He's going to, as I was saying, he's, uh, and we'll see where the interest lies and hopefully somebody will pick it up sooner rather than later and have it out to you, the fans this year. But if not, I would imagine first quarter next year and hopefully, um, Brad will be able to go out there and do a few solo dates. And, um, you know, it's funny, there's a, there's a label out of Australia called Golden Robot. Now, uh, they, they have nothing to do with, with Brad or anything at this point or, or, or ever, I don't know. Uh, but they, they had, uh, they signed John Sykes and, uh, he's putting out an album and I was just thinking, boy, wouldn't it be great if both bands were on, if not the same label, at least the same bill? Could you imagine going to your local club and having a John Sykes, Brad Gillis show, you know, you get you get the best of whatever John sings a little bit, maybe a little bit of Thin Lizzy, a little bit of Tigers of Pantang. Maybe he sings some White Snake stuff, and then Brad comes on and maybe does Crazy Train, and maybe does uh, some some Night Ranger stuff, and then he does his solo album stuff. It would be absolutely, absolutely spectacular as an evening. Uh, uh, you know, the Guitar Mageddon evening but anyway that's that's just a mitch fantasy that is not news i repeat that is not news that's just that's just mitch thinking out loud or or me did i just refer to myself as mitch um okay well hey listen i'm referring to myself in the third person and i'm saying words like delightful anyway this is the blue yeti microphone for you know serious podcasters let's hope that it is good uh it is currently raining right on top of where i am so who knows? Maybe you're going to hear rain. Maybe you're going to hear my chair squeaking. I don't know. But uh, let's see how, how it sounds. Again, head over to my Twitter, at Mitch Lafon, or on Facebook, Rock Talk with Mitch Lafon, etc. And tell me that you've listened and say, hey, boy, that Blue Yeti, ooh, what was that? Or, hey, yeah, keep it going. And who knows? Maybe the ambient sound adds to a conviviality, to a, hey, look at us, we're all together. I mean, anyway. Anyway, uh, enough rambling. I am good at the rambling. Uh, without further ado, here is uh, the one, the only, as we say in Montréal, le seul et unique guitarist Don Felder. We are speaking with guitarist Don Felder. The new album is American Rock and Roll. Good day, Don. Absolute, absolute pleasure to speak with you again. Oh, it's fantastic. It's a beautiful day. I'm on the beach down in Miami Beach. Wow. The sun's coming up. There's uh, people walking out in bikinis onto the sand to go in the water. I'm sitting out on the balcony in my suite. It is a wonderful, beautiful day. Well, um, I'm in Montreal, and it's um, cloudy. <laughs> it's not, you have it's, my deepest sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not the same vibe, but listen, uh, as much as possible over the next 20 minutes, I want to discuss this album in full and as much as possible, because you've got a Canadian on there, Alex Lifeson. Uh, you've got guys that I have loved my entire life, from Slash to uh, uh, Richie Sambora and more. So let me start with the album itself. Uh, the last album, of course, Road to Forever, came out in 2012, I guess it was, so about seven years ago. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. Talk to me about about waiting that, that time, because as you know, listen, in the 70s and 80s, it was... Album tour, album tour, album tour. I mean, I just spoke to, for example, Gino Vanelli. In the 70s, he had nine albums in 10 years. Um, Talk to me about sort of pacing it out and just taking your time to just say, all right, now it's time to get these 10, 12 songs ready to go. Well, what happens is I think I recorded for uh, Road to Forever 17 or 18 songs, ideas. We only finished and put, I think, 12 or 13 out. Uh, and in between touring, like if I'm out on the road for two or three weeks and I go back home and I've got three to five days at home, I don't go out and hang out in the sun by the pool, which everybody would think you have days off. As soon as I get home, 
I dump the dirty clothes out of one suitcase and I go right into the studio. While I'm there, I either write demos, take guitar ideas and blow life into them, set up a Pro Tools session and make a drum loop and just start playing to it to see what I can come up with. I'm constantly writing, whether it's uh, singing into my iPhone, uh, idea for a chorus that just came to me while I'm driving down the 405, trying not to get stopped and arrested by the cops for uh, not using hands-free, uh, or sitting on a plane flying cross-country on a laptop just writing lyrics. Uh, so I spend as much time as I can outside of the studio putting bits and pieces together because I know I have a limited amount of time at home in that environment. If I stopped touring for a year or a year and a half, I could produce another record. The, the other part of this is I don't really care about producing a lot of quantity as much as I like to produce an album that has 10 or 11 or 12 really good tracks on it. Good songs, good lyrics, good production, good guitar parts. And if that takes time, so be it. I, I'm not going to put out something that I think is a three-star uh quality record or three-star quality production. So I try to take my time and be very self-discriminating about how and what I write, record, and put out. Uh, and if you can't, if you're not happy with it, it's not getting you off, then you shouldn't put it out. So that's just my philosophy about making records. And, and so let me follow up with this. Has the songwriting process changed for you? You know, in the 1970s, maybe... Uh, record companies might have come to you and say, hey, we need something that sounds more like a single, or we need something that's more radio-friendly, or we need something. And, of course, you know, with age, we have different outlooks on life. How has the song process changed for you, especially lyrically? Do you sort of write from the same place, or as where you get older, you, you just focus on different things? Well, I think as you mature, and, and uh, the top 40 becomes less important, I don't write songs, and I never really have, including Hotel California, to have a hit. No one imagined uh, that to have the success that it had. And I didn't write the whole song. I only wrote, you know, the music for it. And Don Henley came up with a brilliant set of lyrics for it, and along with Glenn Fry and a, an amazing vocal. And just the whole thing came together with Walsh and I arranging guitar parts on the end. It was just you know, it was a magical combination, but at the time, nobody felt that was going to be a hit single. It was just a wrong format at the time for AM radio. So I, I, I'd i never tried to write with a specific target. I write for what I find to be exciting, but I write that when I hit the play button at the end of the day, I like what I hear. I like the song. I like the lyrics. I like, like the way the guitar sounds and the parts that came up. And if I don't, I send it to Digital Heaven, which is the erase head. Goodbye. <laughs> away it's gone. So I, uh, I try to be very discriminating about what I put out. And if it doesn't turn me on, it's just not worth putting out. There's a song on this record called Charmed, C-H-A-R-M-E-D. Yes, which I'm going to ask you Alex, about next. Right. Alex license played on this with me. And the reason I chose Alex is most Canadians, and I have the utmost respect for Canadians, I think they're probably probably the nicest group of humans walking around on this planet today. The most courteous, kind, thoughtful, generous, loving people. And I think it's because the country is so vast and so harsh in the winter that everybody's got to lock together and hold hands to get through those conditions. So I remember stopping on the side of Trans-Canada Highway outside of Calgary before they had Bluetooth handsets. And sitting there talking on the phone, and three guys stopped and went, hey, you okay? You got trouble? You need help? And, no, 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 I'm just making a call. Thank you. And they drive off, and two or three minutes later, somebody else was there. I could be sitting there and be a de completely decomposed skeleton in Los Angeles before anybody stopped to even ask if I was okay. So uh, I, uh, you guys have a great human respect for each other. And at the same time, Unless you're a hockey star, you know, if you're a musician, okay. If you're a comedian, all right. You know, in the movies, the television, okay. But if you're a hockey star to a Canadian, you are, quote-unquote, a rock god, right? So I agree. Uh, 
all the trappings that go along with success, whether it's music business or a regular business where you make gobs of money and you've got a big private jet and a huge home somewhere and fast, fancy cars, blah, blah, blah. All of that stuff doesn't matter. If the passion in what you're doing, it has lost its charm. In other words, that, that's what that song is about. And it's, uh, you can have all the success you want, but what got you there was your passion in the first place about what you were doing. And so I go back to that source of me being excited and passionate about something. And I thought Alex would be the perfect person that would understand that, being Canadian, and, uh, and want to be able to express his brilliant talents on that particular track along with me. So let me ask you about that. And, and just briefly, you mentioned Hotel California. In 2014, you did a version with the guys from Foreigner and Styx and... Um, Absolutely brilliant. I love, I love, I love, I love that version. Um, but okay, let me let me get over to Alex here. He he is of course Canadian, of course from Rush. The band is, I would say, perhaps wrongly, we can argue about it, but I would say Rush is definitely different musically than uh, than the Eagles were. Um, talk to me about him as a guitarist, sort of as as Don Felder, the guitarist. If you would look at Alex Lifeson as a guitarist, what would you sort of say is are his strengths? And and just talk to me about also the band Rush. Were you a fan of Rush at all? Oh, absolutely. You know, Alex, anytime you're the guitarist in a power trio, you have an incredible burden. You have to carry all the rhythm parts, all the solo parts, you have to fill the space in the void, which is a large space between the bass and drums. Everything else is on your shoulder. So not only have you got to be very creative, original, and have a great amount of dexterity and control of your instrument, but you got to step up and be the whole band, except for bass and drums. And so I had never seen them live, although Neil Peart had become a friend of mine in LA because his daughter and my youngest son went to preschool together and he was over at a birthday party at my house about three years ago and I had my band there and I think Stephen Stills came and jammed with me and we just had a party, you know, we're just having fun. <clears throat> and he had told me at that time that he was pretty much done working with Rush. Three, maybe four years ago, I don't remember the exact year. So Alex and I had been doing some charity events together for St. Jude's Children's Hospital, playing golf, hanging out. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so I kept thinking about Alex and knowing how he played and what a brilliant guitarist he is. Must be sitting around twiddling his thumbs, just waiting for something to do. So I, I sent him an email and went, hey, Alex, uh, would you be interested in you know maybe playing down, laying down some guitars on a kind of a rock track? And he wrote back, bam! Yeah, sure. Just send me the files and I'll get right on it. So we uploaded files to him. And I think the next day or a couple of days later, I got back uh, three or four passes of him playing electric guitar solos. And oh, in that email, he said, well, what do you want me to do? I said, anything you want. Just play when and wherever you want on this thing. So he played some acoustic guitar and the bridge, I think, and some solos on the ending. And then I went in and edited some of his solos so I could have him play a phrase and me play a phrase and we could kind of alternate back and forth. And then the very last phrase he played, I went in and figured out the harmony to play exactly with him, the harmony on that last line. And it just kind of went together with a big hug and a, a handshake and everything kind of meld together. And I thought it turned out really well. I love Alex. I think he's a great guy. I just posted a photo on my Instagram page of him and I playing my 1275 together where I'm playing one neck and he's playing the other all that double neck and we just we had so much fun together it's just a great guy and love hanging out with him and it was a really yeah. a, a flattering thing that he did by playing on my record I appreciated it yeah it really is and, and I did see the, those pictures I followed the socials but uh, you mentioned uh, Neil Neil's daughter on the way things have to be on this album, you have, of course, a Peter Frampton, but you also have your daughter, Leia, on it. Talk to me a little bit about uh, uh, working with your daughter, because, you know, you, you, you're, you're there for all the diaper changing. You watch them grow up. Talk to me uh, about 
you know, daddy having daughter on an album, because that's got to be sort of the ultimate, right? Well, not really. Uh, Leah, uh, I discovered how brilliant her vocals were when she was eight years old. I actually took her to one of the leading vocal coaches in Los Angeles, a guy named Joel Ewing, who works with everybody that's doing film, television, recording, blah, blah, blah. He's like, the guy. I'd worked with him myself in the past. I called him up and said, I'd like to bring my daughter in and have you take a look at her. And he says, well, okay, how old is she? And I said, eight. He says, I don't take kids. I said, no, 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 I don't want you to take her. I just want you to give me an assessment of what you think is going on or if I'm just being a proud papa or what. And so please tell me, you know. So I take her in and uh, he sits down with her and she'd been doing this little thing on Showboat. Uh, and he said, sing something for me, a cappella. And she sings. And he starts playing and says, okay, you sing this. And he plays something on the right hand going higher and higher and higher. And he's trying to find the top of the rage. And so, okay, sing this. And he plays the line going lower and lower and lower. And she sings it. So he knows her width of range. He says, okay, sing your showboat song. And he starts playing along with her. And her pitch has always been exceptionally in tune, no matter what she sings. That's why I took her there for an eight-year-old. She was incredibly in tune. And uh, he said, I want to see her every week. I said, you don't take kids. He says, I know, but I think I can do something really extraordinary with Leah. So for the next 10 years, we drive her in and out, in and out from Malibu into Hollywood to this vocal coach uh, until she gets the license at 60 and she starts driving herself. And she would go upstairs at the end of these lessons with the cassette and practice herself over and over and over every night. It wasn't like, okay, you got to go practice your vocals. Now it's time. She would just go do it. She loved to do it. He made, built her voice into this really just heavyweight championship quality voice. So she started playing with me in my touring band back oh, 10 years ago, maybe. And finally, uh, she came to me after a couple of years because she, she got really comfortable on stage. She got really comfortable singing on stage. We used to do Pride and Joy together where I'd sing a verse, she'd sing a verse and uh, got her ears molded. So she was using in ears. She got it comfortable with those. She finally came to me and said, Dad, I can't play with you anymore. I went, why? Did I do something wrong? She said, no, it's time for me to do my own music. And I had never been happier to hear something like that from my daughter. It's like you've been holding their hand and finally they're telling you to let go. And off she went. And she's written some just brilliant songs. This last record she's put out, the stuff she did before with her and Brandon. She's just a an unbelievably talented songwriter and vocalist. I just helped her put together a new studio and a new house where she's about halfway through all the writing for a new album. She's just a super gifted person. I don't know where she gets all that talent. To tell you. <laughs> well, probably a little bit from you. Probably a little bit. Uh, speaking of uh, super talented, because there's a lot of people on here that we still haven't touched. Uh, we, we, Richie Sambora, Sammy Hagar, and Slash. So I will start with... Slash, now he's on the title track, American Rock and Roll, that also has Chad Smith and Mick Fleawood. I mean, holy mackerel, talk, talk about a power uh, lineup just for that one track. But from what I understand, Slash is, is your neighbor or lives nearby. And, and talk to me about getting him, because when you think Guns N' Roses, sort of America's most dangerous band, and you think Eagles or you think Don Felder, you sort of think they come from different places, but in a sense... It's all rock and roll. It's all American rock and roll at the end of the day, right? Talk, talk to me about Slash. Uh, Slash is really just a really sweet guy. I mean, he has this image of being dangerous, and, but he's a really nice person. I would almost think he could almost become an honorary Canadian. He's so nice. But uh, he lives near me. Uh, we reached out to him. He and I had done some... Uh, some uh, work together at charities, I think for a charity up for Seymour Duncan, who makes guitar pickups up in Santa Barbara. And uh, so we reached out to him and he lives nearby and he stopped by with his guitar and I set him up in one of my marshals and had him play, uh, I think three or four different passes, just top to bottom. First, I was only going to have him play on the verse that mentions uh, Guns N' Roses slash and, uh, Rose. Uh, and then it just sounded so great. I said, run back to the top and just make a couple of passes top to bottom, just play. And so we did. And then, 
we packed him up and I set up a guitar and sat there and redid some overdubs of my own, a little bit of editing, uh, around his stuff, uh, to give myself a little room so we could, he could play a solo and I would answer the end of it. And, uh, he would play a line and I would simulate a slide like Dwayne taught me to play slide guitar on the part that talks about, uh, Greg and Dwayne at the Fillmore East and just places uh, where I would throw in things like to emulate Hendrix, uh, the very first line there I played, what a that which is kind of like what Hendrix would play. Uh, and uh, just had fun working with him. He's a great guy. He's really a very nice guy. And he, he probably hates that I say that, but indeed he is truly a nice man. Yeah, I, I agree. I've, I've had a chance to uh, hang out with him a couple of times. He's just incredibly, incredibly gifted and nice. Um, let me get over to Limelight. On this one, you have uh, Orianthi, uh, who, of course, was Michael Jackson's guitarist for a while. And yes, last year, the Eagles' greatest hits did outsell uh, Michael Jackson's Thriller for the first time ever. But you've also got Richie Sambor from Bon Jovi. So l- let me ask you about this, because Richie, to me, is one of the most underrated guitar heroes out there you know when you think of bon jovi a lot of people think oh well it's soft rock it's pop rock it's and and for some reason even though they sell out stadiums there there seems to be a a lack of respect for the musicianship and yet when you listen to richie's solos and you listen to him sing dudes i mean he's just overflowing with talent so Talk to me about Richie, and then maybe we can also talk about Orianti, but in terms of a guitarist, how do you sort of qualify his playing? Is it tasteful? Is it appropriate? Is it is it just spectacular? How do you sort of rate or rank, and maybe that's not fair, but Richie and his playing and getting him on this album? Well, a couple of things. Richie asked me, he was being awarded uh, this special honorarium uh, from the L.A. Mission, which is a group of nuns that put together health care and uh, food packages for the homeless. And he had donated a, a van equipped with all medical support to go through downtown L.A. to the homeless and treat them medically. If they needed stitches or they needed antibiotics or they needed help or uh, dental work, they could actually provide loving care to people that didn't have any insurance, go through the harshest part of downtown LA, not just the homeless, but the, you know, the low income and provide, you know, free care. So they were giving him this humanitarian award. He asked me if I'd come play there with my band, which I did and uh, help them raise money. Uh, And I said, I'll do it under one condition that you'll get up and play with me a couple of songs. So he agreed to do it. I think we did uh, pride and joy and take it easy or something together. So yeah, if you go on YouTube and you put in Don Felder, Richie Sambor, you can probably find that if it's still up. Uh, anyway, uh, after that, when I was, I, I had that song called The Shuffle, you know, uh, Limelight. And I kept thinking, who could I get to play a great shuffle? And Richie is the man. That's right up his alley. So uh, I reached out and he said, yeah, come on over to my house. He had his uh, studio set up in his kitchen. I've made records all over the world, but never in a kitchen. The great part of it is you could just reach out and grab the pot, coffee pot and top off your cup without having to get up and go to the kitchen to get another cup of coffee. Uh, so we're there playing away, and he's doing a great job on it. And uh, just, you know, er- everything's running down great. And I look around, and down the staircase comes Orianti. And I'd completely forgotten that Richie and Orianti at that time, and this is two, maybe two and a half years ago, were a couple. They were living together. So Orianti and I had uh, done a bunch of charity events when she was playing with Alice Cooper and different events. I think we just did one a couple of months ago with Billy Gibbons and Joe Bonamassa and a bunch of people called Guitar Legends 2. She comes out and plays Hotel with me and Pride and Joy. Just a bunch of fun stuff. I said, Orianti, you got to get a guitar. you got to play on this record. She's got on cut-off shorts and a t-shirt and a baseball hat and I didn't even think she had had breakfast or a cup of coffee yet when she came downstairs. She grabs the guitar, plugs in, and just absolutely kills it. I, I swear, I think she should be uh, recognized as probably the best female rock and roll guitarist 
going today. I mean, there's a lot of other girls out there playing, but she is. I saw her when she was 18 or 19 when she first came to the U.S. Paul Reed Smith grabbed me at a NAMM show and said, you've got to come up to my booth and see this girl play. I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, no, 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 you've got to come. So I go up there with Paul, and she's standing there by herself with just her and a microphone and a guitar and an amp, just ripping, singing, playing, soloing, no drums, no backing tracks, nothing. And I went, you're right, Paul. She's got exactly what it takes. She's going to be a big star. So uh, it just turned out to be a really fortunate uh, opportunity to have Orianti on the record and unexpected. I'd completely forgotten that she was there. So yeah. to have Richie and Orianti both on the same track at the same time in the same kitchen was a really pleasant surprise. I thought that record came out really well. That that, that really did. And I'll, and I'll just say this. Alice Cooper has a knack for picking out talent because between Orianti and Nita Strauss, he has picked two of the best ever. And I'll finish with this because I know we're We've got exactly four minutes here before we got to go. But uh, last song uh, that we're going to talk about is Rock You. That, of course, has Joe Satriani and Sammy Hagar. And, and for most of us uh, that are maybe a little bit younger, he was the vocalist for Van Halen for many years. But, of course, he was Montrose and Sammy Hagar solo and a lot more. Just talk to me, first of all, about getting Sammy on the album, but also vocally, because he, he, he is... A beast on on vocals. I mean, absolutely everything he's done from from uh, the old Montrose all the way up to the Van Halen stuff and beyond. You can't you can't deny it. the guy sings like a monster. Absolutely. I, I wanted to write a rock stadium anthem uh, that I thought would be a fun thing to be able to play in these big sheds, uh, 12, 15, 20,000 seat places. And so I came up with that song, Rock You but I wanted to do a rock duet. So I needed somebody that just had that classic gravelly rock and roll tone, which I can kind of get close to, but not like what I wanted on this record. So I called up Sammy, thought about Sammy. He and I have done soundtrack work together where we both wrote heavy metal songs for that heavy metal soundtrack. Uh, We've done charity work together. I was on his TV show, Rock and Roll Road Trip. And uh, he did Hotel California with me on that particular uh, time. And then, uh, so I called him up and said, hey, I've got this rock anthem. I'd love to have you sing. Oh, yeah, sure, come on up to my studio. So I hop on a plane and fly up to San Francisco, and he's got a great studio in Sausalito. And we set up a mic, and literally in a matter of less than an hour, he sung uh, around my lead vocal, uh, the parts where I said, okay, I'm going to sing the first verse. You sing the second verse, we'll trade back and forth on the choruses, blah, blah, blah. And just kind of put it together there on the spot and uh, did an amazing job. While we're there, uh, Satriani shows up and we grab him and set up a guitar for him and a guitar for me. And uh, he and I sit in the control room and figure out where who's going to play what. We do some harmony stuff at the end and then answers. And then uh, I give Joe the main solo in the middle of it because he's just such a monster. And it was so fun to sit there with him with two guitars and work out parts, much less, much like we had done with Walsh back in Hotel California, where we sat together and figure out what we're going to play. And I'll play this lick and you answer and blah, 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 and kind of piece things together like that, work out harmonies together. It was just really fun and exciting. And Joe did an incredible job on it. And uh, if anything, that's going to be a tough song for me to play live because there's no way I'm going to be able to play Joe Satriani parts. I'm going to have to figure out some other way to uh, kind of emulate that stuff and uh, not try to rip him off and play that stuff for David for David for him. So, yeah, anyway, good. Joe did a great job. I appreciate Sammy doing it. And Joe did it. We had a great time together. And there we go. Uh, I remind folks, uh, Don Felder's American Rock and Roll is out now. Don, very much appreciated. And uh, as we say in Montreal, merci beaucoup. And I'll add, thank you for all the music over the years, from the, the, the first songs to these new songs. Always quality, always fun. And as a fan, uh, again, merci. Thank you. Thank you so much for today. I, I cannot wait to come back to Canada and tour up there this summer, my friend. Thank you. Cheers. Have a good one. You're listening to Rock Talk with Mitch LaFond. Rock Talk.